Hi, welcome to Math 317 Operations Research. This is lecture give or take 24. What I want to do today is I want to talk about Swinner's Law. I want to prove it in the one dimensional case first, more vigorously than we did last time, in a way that's going to generalize nicely to the two dimensional case. And then from that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about you know, some technical results from real analysis, and then if time permits, I want to show you a little bit about how to attack some GOE problems to just look at them and see what the answer should be without actually doing all the calculations. I'm just trying to get to focus a little better. Okay, so Spoon is not. And we'll start off in one dimension. So we have zero, we have one, and then in the insides over here, you can put in either a zero or a one anywhere in through here. And the claim is the number of zero, one segments is R. And this amazingly is one of the most powerful proof techniques we have. If you can show something is not <coughs> negative and odd, it exists. Okay, so the proof is interesting. We have either 0, 0, 1, 0, which is the same as 0, 1, and we have 1, 1. And let's count the number of zeros. So when you count the number of zeros, how many zeros does this contribute? To how many does this contribute? One, and this contributes. So if we call um, the number here, call it you know, T00, T01, and T11, the number of zeros I claim is twice T00 plus T01, and I don't have to include the T11. Is that correct? Does that correctly count the number of zeros? If you divide by two, it's right there. Okay, so we've got to be careful. We're definitely double counting some zeros. But not we, the end. Right. So we okay, so if it's the end point, we're not double counting. But all the interior ones we double count. So what do we how do we fix this? I mean it would be easiest to just count the end pairs like wrap it around and then just subtract it off at the end. Okay, so we if we wrap it around. Um then have we double counted every time. Yes. But we're gonna have to take away one segment. Right. So let's try to analyze it just from here. So which are the ones that are double counted? It's the anything that's interior is double counted. So this is equal to the number of interior zeros right and how many times do we count the interior zeros so each interior zero is counted how often twice it's counted once to the left and once to the right and then we have to include the one zero at the end So this is another way to look at the calculation. If I do two times the number of zero, zero segments <coughs> plus the number of zero, one segments, that counts the number of zeros, but it counts all the interior ones twice. Well, let's just explicitly write it. It's counted the interior ones twice, and then I have the extra one at the end. Well, even number, even number, odd number, therefore t zero one is odd. So therefore, t zero one is odd. And that's the proof. So it's a really slick, elegant proof. We had proofs of this before. You know, last time we showed that as we went through, uh, we could prove that there has to be at least one segment. That was easy. We also showed that there had to be an odd number of segments by using the monovariance. That as we add a new point and put in a new label, we change the number of zero, one segments either by zero or by two. Here's another way of doing it. 
explicitly bringing into account the even oddness. Okay, any questions about this? So we're going to then take this and then we're going to prove the result in two dimensions. And we'll prove that there will be an odd number of 0, 1, 2 triangles. By now, you should be able to predict what comes next. All right, what comes next? After we do the triangles and the 0, 1, 2 triangle exists, then there's an odd number of them. We do tetrahedra. And what will we prove for tetrahedra? An odd number of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, no, boy, no, I'm sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, sorry. And then what happens after the tetrahedra? Hypertetrahedra. And then maybe hyper, hyper, I don't know. I don't know what the language is, but as you just keep going on and on and on, each previous case is used to then get the next one. All right, so now let's talk about how we would do the, the proof in the next case. So, two dimensions. So, any valid triangularization plus labeling has an odd number of 0, 1, 2 triangles. And again, what we mean by this So I've got a bunch of triangles. No triangle shear is just part of a wall. You either share an entire wall or none of a wall. And down here, it has to be 0, it has to be 1, it has to be 2. You can only do 0 and 1 down here. You can only do 1 and 2 over here. And you can only do 0 and 2 over here. But on the inside, you can do anything. And we want to prove that there has to be at least one zero one two triangle. I'm trying to remember, when Professor Su lectured, did he talk about how that gives us a fixed point theorem? So we've already seen the motivation that there is a reason why we care so much about this. So let's try to play the same game as before. What do we know about this triangle? So there's an odd number of 0, 1 segments. So we have a lot of different types of triangles. Right. So the first question is, how many different types of triangles do we have? Any thoughts as to how many different types of triangles? Or give me some types of triangles. Zero, zero, zero. Okay, so one is all the same. So there would be the zero, 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 the one, 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 the two, two, two. And I don't care. Okay, so yeah, next. Uh, like you have just zero, one, two, or one, two, zero. Okay, yeah. so all different. So zero, one, two. Well, for us, it's not going to really matter the order. Oh. You could have two the same and one different. You could have two same one different. So we could do zero zero one zero zero two. We could do um, one one zero one one two, right? And then two two zero two two one. And I believe that's it. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it looks like there's 10 different types of triangles. Which of these triangles do you think are going to matter for us? I'm sorry, the last one definitely matters. 
What else is going to matter? What do you say about your question? Um, which of the two? All of them or just some of them? The ones with the zero one. Yeah, the ones with the zero one. We know that there's an odd number of zero one segments on the bottom. So the idea is to somehow propagate that information upward. So in other words, I don't think any of these will really matter. These won't matter. Uh, this will matter, this won't matter, and this won't matter. So these should be the only ones that really matter in terms of what we're doing. So you have T001, T110, we're going to just use 001, and then T012. So we can count the number of 01 segments. How many <coughs> zero 01 segments are there on this side? None. Zero. And on this side? Now, so how many zero one segments does T001 give us? So zero zero one, how many segments does that give us? Two, right? The zero one that way, the zero one that way. So I get two times T001. How about zero one one? How many does that give us? Also two. How about the T012? One. Yeah, I just wanted to see which figure you raised. <laughs> My daughter uh, taught her teacher how to count to uh, four in binary. <laughs> now, if you're really good, you can count all the way up to 132. Okay. So this counts how many zero one segments we have, but it double counts everything that's interior. Right? So this is going to be twice the number of interior zero one segments, right? Plus what? The odd number on the bottom. Plus the number on the bottom. <coughs> and this is odd. So the proof is not that bad. Even, even, even. So this must be odd. And that finishes the proof. So we took the fact that there was an odd number here and we propagated it up. If this was a post-core 300 level class, then probably you know, a rigorous homework assignment would be just push this forward into arbitrary dimensions and just keep going. To me, this is more than enough. I don't see any need to try to draw a three-dimensional tetrahedra or you know, bring one of the Rubik's cubes that I could use for something like that. Um, I think this is more than enough. Okay. If you do not think it's clear, I strongly urge you to try to do the next dimension and just see what goes on, and you'll be propagating upward like this. So this is a truly amazing result, no matter how you color. Uh, so no matter how you assign the labels, as long as it's zero, one on the bottom, et cetera, et cetera, and inside is completely free, there will always be an odd number of zero one triangles. And now the question is, how the hell does this help us get a fixed point? We'll later see that there's a way to put in these labels that is going to be related to values of a function. And basically, the zero, one, and two will be telling you which direction things are going. And the only way you can be pointing in all the different directions, to be multiple of all those different directions, is if you're zero. So what we want to do is we <coughs> want to show, if we took a triangularization like this and then had a refinement, where we subdivided the triangles, that there would still be a zero, one, two triangle somewhere. And if we did a refinement of that, there'd be a zero, one, two triangle. So that if we keep going and going and going, we can get smaller and smaller and smaller zero, one, two triangles. And then in the limit, you'll get a zero, one, two triangle whose size is going to zero. And so you'll have, you're very similar to what we had last time, you'll have a sequence of points where it's always zero, a sequence of points where it's always one, a sequence of points where it's always two, converging. And so the only common value that it can be is it's gonna be labeled zero, one, and two on the interior. And that will essentially mean that the derivative is zero that it's left fixed. That's essentially how this is gonna give us a fixed point there. What we need to prove now is that we can get a sequence of zero, one, two triangles that will converge to some point. And this is where it would be very useful to have some real analysis. 
So we will do a little bit of real analysis today. Anybody know what they are? I'm going to have a sequence of triangles, and I want to be able to show that a subsequence is converging. How nice they are. Bolzano yes, Bolzano Weierstrass. Yes, excellent. Have you taken real analysis? Yes. I would have been extremely impressed if you had not taken real analysis. <laughs> I just somehow said Bolzano Weierstrass. I don't know too much about Bolzano, but Weierstrass has a lot of wonderful theorems in complex analysis. And the idea is the following. You have a sequence AN in a compact, that means plus closed and bounded set, then a subsequence converges. Whenever you see a result, especially a result in analysis, you want to remove a statement. You want to remove one of the conditions and show that it's false. Or typically, the proof is much harder. So can you give me an example where we remove one of the conditions, either closed or bounded? The way you wrote it, you actually can remove closed. Yeah. Well, then we have a subsequence converges. Then, then a subsequence converges to a point in the set. So I'll phrase it like that, so I'll be OK now. I have taken real analysis as a student, but I've never taught it. I've never taken abstract algebra as a student, but I have taught it. And so I sometimes am a little careless in uh, making the statements. So we move a condition, if not closed. What's your count example? So a n equals 1 over n in 0, 1. So clearly, I don't know why this likes to keep moving up and down. Um, so clearly, this is going to converge to 0 as n goes to infinity, but 0 is not in the set. All right, we move bounded. So a n equals n in the reals. It's not going to converge. Okay. So if we remove conditions, the result can be false. As an aside, here's one of my favorite results. So uh, a number <coughs> is algebraic if it is a root of a finite degree polynomial with integer coefficients. Otherwise, it's transcendental. So for a long time, <coughs> nobody knew any transcendental numbers. Anybody want to guess a transcendental number? <coughs> Almost any number is transcendental. So almost every number is transcendental. It's a higher infinity than the algebraic numbers. Now, the numbers you know from real life are almost all algebraic. So the numbers you know are essentially a zero probability event of it happening. Anybody want to give you a transcendental number? Yes. Do you know B? Yes. E is transcendental. And if E is on the list, who else has to be on the list? Pi, of course, you know, E and pi Q. Here's the great theorem. Either E plus pi or E times pi is transcendental. What kind of or is this? It's the inclusive or. We believe both of them are transcendental. If you can prove either one of them and tell me which one, I will get you a Princeton PhD thesis and an A plus in the course. I'll also work to get cash prizes. Okay? We can prove at least one is transcendental. Does anybody know 
a fact that might be useful in this proof. Even if I had equal negative. Excellent. E to the i pi equals negative 1. It uses information about e and pi. Right. So this was not a fancy question. <coughs> this has absolutely nothing to do with the proof. This is one of the few examples where putting in extra information is actually misleading and has nothing to do with what's going on. Most of the time, when you see a statement like this, there's a reason why you have these conditions. The conditions are needed. You know, people have spent a lot of time. Or if they're not needed, the proof is more complicated. So when I was an undergraduate, I was always upset when we didn't prove theorems in the greatest generality. Well, why are you assuming my function is infinitely differentiable? And then I went to grad school and I actually started using theorems to prove results that I cared about and to do research. Like, oh yeah, of course my function is infinitely differentiable. Yeah, 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 I'm not, I'm not gonna worry about that hyper-technical case. And so I want you to get some sense of what we need and why. So a lot of times, these conditions just make the theorems easier to prove. And a lot of times for the applications, you don't need the most general case. So for instance, we don't need the most general notion of what is a compact set. We're gonna be working with triangles, okay? Triangle is a nice shape to deal with. I'm gonna quickly <coughs> sketch the proof and use the following result. If alpha and beta are algebraic, so are alpha plus beta and alpha times beta. So that's just a nice exercise to show that if you have a polynomial with rational coefficients of finite degree for alpha and beta, then you can do it for these as well. And so assume alpha and beta are transcendental. I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. Assume um, alpha plus beta and alpha times beta are both transcendental. Then, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we're doing proof by contradiction. Are both what? <coughs> Algebraic. Then, alpha plus beta squared minus four alpha beta is also algebraic. And this is equal to alpha minus beta squared. And from this with a little bit of work, you can get alpha minus beta is algebraic. So then alpha plus beta plus alpha minus beta is two alpha is algebraic. And that's a contradiction. You know, we can get rid of a factor of two. So again, the whole purpose of this is to just show you that it is possible to be misled as to what you really need in terms of conditions. Okay. So let's quickly talk about why Bolzano of Iostros is true. And so we've shown that the conditions of being closed and bounded are important. So proof for a square. Okay, you can prove this in a more general, I'm gonna just give you the proof in the square and make it nice. I will divide the square into four parts. We have our sequence an. Is it possible that there are only finitely many values of an in each box? <coughs> no, because there's infinitely many terms. Finite plus finite plus finite plus finite is finite. So one of the boxes has infinitely many. Which one would you like it to be? Top left, okay. It's always interesting as to which people, which box do people consider is the generic one to choose. Is it top left, top right? Uh, do you know the joke about the flat tire? So the joke is two students are, are blowing off a class in college. They've had no trouble at all, so they decide they don't need to stick around and study. They go out, visit friends and party all weekend, <coughs> and then they oversleep. And they get back to campus, you know, after the exam has happened. So they go to the professor, they're very apologetic. They say, we're very, very sorry. We were visiting friends, we got a flat tire and it just took forever for us to get here. So I said, look, you guys have been getting straight A's all semester, no, no worries at all. You know, you wanna take the test this afternoon? That'd be wonderful. 
So the afternoon comes and they each get the test and it's two questions. The first question you know, for five points is a very simple basic question. And the second one is for 95 points, which tire? Which tire? <laughs> and so the question is, you know, which would you say is the canonical tire in a situation like this? Perfect. I would, I would go with fun ride, passenger ride. Um, but just the advice from this is, you know, if you're gonna have a story, I probably should not be advising like that. We'll go, we'll go with the upper left. Now what do we do? There's gotta be some point in here, let's call that A sub K sub one, the first term in our new sequence. And now, look at all N greater than equal to <coughs> A1, such that A N is in the upper left. What must be true? What can we do now? So we can divide it again, and one of these boxes must have infinitely many. Let's say this time it's the bottom right. What should we call that point? Building on our successful labeling of the first as AK1, AK2. Then look at all n greater than equal to k2 such that a n is in the second box. Or I'd say second chosen box. And then just continuing arguing like this. And what you can see is each time we do this, the size of the box is gonna go down by a factor of <coughs> four. four. So you're gonna get a sequence of points that is gonna converge. And then the question is just how much rigor do you want to say that this is converging? Is this enough rigor? If this leaves you unsatisfied, I strongly urge you to take real analysis where they will prove it rigorously. For me, I think this is good enough you know, for pre-core 300 level class that yeah, it's converging, you know, I'm getting a sequence of points and they're all getting in a nested chain of boxes. You know, each box is in the previous, the width and the length of each box is half of what the previous one was. So as I keep iterating this, it's gotta to converge to a point. You know, you can't have two different points because the box thickness will eventually be smaller than that. So when we have our sequence of triangles that have zero, one, two labels, we will be able to choose a subsequence that converges. Is a stronger result true? Does the sequence <coughs> AN have to converge? So give me a counterexample. So give me an example on the interval 0, 1, where the sequence AN does not converge. Sine. Okay. Sine. Sine. Um, okay. So that, that will work. And your sine n is gonna just keep moving around, moving around, moving around. So the series doesn't converge at all. You could do it's zero if n is even and one if n is odd. It's just gonna hop back and forth between those two. And so what's nice about that is both of these examples show you that you can have actually multiple different subsequences converging and they can converge to different values. So with your sine of n, sine of n turns out to be dense in zero, one. You give me any point and I can get arbitrarily close to it for some n. So any point can be taken to be what a sequence, con a sequence <coughs> converges to. My example, I only have two, okay? So this is all we're going to need um, for Sperner's lemma to get to the fixed points. Any questions about this? Okay, how many of you are considering going on to graduate school? Okay, how many of you are considering it in mathematics? All right. There is still, I've got to be very careful because this is being recorded. Um, there is a <coughs> wonderful opportunity if you are considering graduate school where you can help a business stay financially solvent. It's called the graduate record exam. And for a modest fee, you can take this exam and in the 21st century, in the age of the electron, by paying another modest fee for each individual school you want to go to, you could have your score sent to that school. It's wonderful. Okay?
Now, different schools put different weights on the GRE. The biggest mistake a lot of my students have had in the past is they have not allocated their time efficiently. And given that this is a class on optimization, I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about how should you allocate your time on an exam like this. So when you have a bunch of questions, what should you do? Glance over the whole thing and see which ones are easy. So I wouldn't glance over the whole thing because that takes too much time. What should you do? Skip hard questions. Skip hard questions. As you're going through, look at a question and say, can I solve this quickly? If the answer is yes, solve it. If the answer is no, put it off to the side and make sure you record which ones you haven't done. Make sure you put your answers in the right place. What's your definition of solving quickly? Uh, so I don't, I don't know how many questions are on the So let, 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 let's, say, let's say there's 100 questions, and let's say there's 10 minutes. No, this is not the case. Um, so. I mean, it would be, uh, if I could do it in six seconds or less. Why six seconds? Because 10 minutes divided by 100 questions. All right, so here, let, 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 seconds per question. let's do it um, 100 seconds and 10 questions. We'll do it this way. All right, um, so what's your threshold now? Uh, to 10, 10 seconds. If I could so do 10 seconds or less. If 10 seconds or less, so you quickly look at it and think, do I think I can get this in 10 seconds or less? Now, if there's a lot of questions that are easy for you, you might actually say it may be 15 seconds or less. Do. You know, if you think, well, okay, this is going to take me a little bit of time, but not too much time, and then there are other questions I know I can whip through quickly, I'm willing to gamble a little bit. But if you look at this and say, oh, this could take me you know, two minutes, well, given that two minutes actually exceeds the amount of time you have, it should be clear that you do not want to do this. So what I thought I would do is I would tell you two jury questions and talk to you about how to solve them. So the first is the painting the professor's house. If this is too theoretical, let me know and I'm sure we can find a way to make it more. <laughs> So I need a name. Bill. Bill. Is Bill fast or slow? Slow. OK, Bill takes three days to paint the house. OK? I need somebody else who's fast. Donna. Donna. Can you name me a song with Donna? It was back to the 1960s. It was a movie made about him. Who sings it? Who sings the song Donna, cultural credit? It's not his most famous song. His most famous song is La Bamba. Nope, Richie Valens. So Donna takes two days to paint a house. And now the two of them paint together. How long for both? So normally they would give you five choices, A, B, C, D, and E. How would you solve this problem? So, that, so that's one way. That's a nice way to do the algebra. So in six days, they do how many houses? So we'll just do Donald will do three, so we'll paint five. Three and five. So it takes do five houses. So therefore, it takes six fifths of a day. <coughs> yes. Because he, he paints a third of a house a day. He paints a right. So another a day. way is. Bill paints a third of a house per day. 
Donna paints half of a house a day. So if they paint for D days, it has to paint the whole house. And so you would solve, and not surprisingly, if you do the algebra, you get 5, 6, D equals 1. So this also leads to, I think this is a little bit slicker in terms of you know, simplifying the algebra. Both are fine. Typically, what is your objective when you are trying to answer multiple choice questions? Eliminate the wrong ones. It is not to calculate the correct answer. That's not your goal. Your goal is to, as quickly as possible, eliminate the wrong answers. I sometimes have fun with my research students and talk about the day my thesis advisor called me to his office and gave me five bound thesis drafts and said one of them, and they're labeled A, B, C, D, and E, is a correct PhD thesis. And if you choose wisely, you will have your PhD. This is not how graduate school works. But we do use tests like this as a gatekeeper, sadly, for a lot of people getting into graduate school. For a lot of these problems, you can look at it, and only one answer will work. You can eliminate. Can you give me any bounds on the answer? The definitely going to be below two days. I'm sorry? The definitely going to be below two days. It's definitely going to be below two days. So we know D is clearly less than equal to two days, because even if Bill does nothing, we'll assume Bill at least doesn't distract her. <laughs> greater than one day. And it's going to be at least greater than one day. Why is it greater than one day? Because two Donnas. So two Donnas would take a day. So that's a good low value. <coughs> Can we get a better upper bound than two days? Day and a half, because two Bills would take a day and a half. So we know it's better than 1.5 days. So without doing any calculation, we know it's between one and one and a half. And almost surely in a problem like this, you will only have uh, one answer in that range. So this is a really good skill to have, is can you quickly look at something and get a feel for what the answer is without doing the calculation? So Kim by now is doing some algebra inequalities, and they have to you know, draw owls on the real line for which numbers satisfy and which don't. And they're always either a one-sided way, a two-sided line, or nothing works. And one of the things I taught him as a quick test is, look, when you're done with your drawing, take the point zero, and you'll see, does it work? All right. So the next one I want to do is I want to do a fun integral. And for this one, I will give you what the different options are. So I want you to integrate from 0 to infinity e to the ax minus e to the bx divided by 1 plus e to the ax times 1 plus e to the bx <coughs> dx. Maybe I won't give you the answers. Anybody want to do this integral? Does this look like anything you know? I, I, I see the swivel nodding, yes. I'm impressed. And if you try to do a change of variables, you know, I could maybe be like u be e to the ax, and then that would be nice over there, but I've got the b's. Any thoughts as to how you might try to do the integral? Uh, unfortunately, a nuclear bomb has been detonated above the atmosphere, causing an electromagnetic pulse, which has fried your electronics. There's one technique I can think of that might work for a problem like this. If you substitute e to the x and then get like e to the a minus e to the b over one. So you could try doing stuff like that. It's, it's going to be nasty. But there is something that might work for this problem. This is calc, you know, one, two guys. Is yeah, it's partial fractions, right? When you see something like this, you hear the groaning, right? So partial fractions might be the way to go. You know, I've got a denominator that factors. So I, I would try partial fractions. I will give you five options. Zero, B, one, C, a minus B, D, A minus B times the log of two, 
And my personal favorite, e, a minus b divided by a times b times the log of 2. So this is a great problem. Yeah. Does this remind you of the old SAT days? You know, one of the things you get good at is can you look at the answers and try to get a sense of what might be right just by looking at the answers. So what do you think the answer is just by looking at these? Or what do you think the candidates are just by looking at these? Okay, D is one of the candidates. Anything else? C and D. C and D. Anything else? I'm sorry? I think E and D are the best candidates just looking at the answers. Three of the five have an A minus B. And two of the five have a log two. So I think because of that, D and E are the most likely just looking at the answers. That's not a proof, but where do wrong answers come from? They come from people who try to do the argument and make a mistake. What are the common mistakes? Well, they might still give you some of the factors in common. This is supposed to be for any value A and B. Can you think of any good choices of A and B to look at? Yeah. No. Yeah. If you do take zero, you're at least integrating zero. Okay. So if you take A equals B equals zero, then the integral is going to be zero. And so this eliminates so by doing that, which you can do very quickly, you've already eliminated one answer. So now does it eliminate B? Yeah. Oh, it also eliminates B. Eliminates A. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, it eliminates B, not A. Okay, sorry. It eliminates B. What else could we do? Instead of taking A equals B equals zero. Could one zero. No, no, no. I, I like the idea of A equals B equals zero, but it's a little bit too extreme. A equals, just A equals B. What do you get if you choose A equals B? Zero. Zero. Right, the numerator vanishes. So this eliminates A and B. We know when we take A equals B that it has to be divisible by a factor of A minus B. So now that very quick check eliminates uh, two answers. Yes? How do you know it eliminates A without it? Oh, like, sorry. You just don't see that Sorry. That seems like it should just only be. Sorry, you're right. It, it eliminates just B again. So you're right. Clearly non-zero if A equals 1, B equals 0. You're absolutely right. You, you have to note that it's not identically 0. Absolutely correct. So. Yes. Well, also, there's some validity in getting the a equals b equals zero case because we get an answer, which e has a b in the denominator, mm -hmm. so it would be undefined that mm -hmm. way, right? But you would have an a minus b upstairs. Okay, so if we take the case where one of them equals zero and the other, and hold the other constant, we should see what happens. We should see what happens. Now. What I love to do is I love to put in units. When you exponentiate something, it's unitless. You know, e to the u is 1 plus u plus u squared over 2 plus u cubed over 6 plus over 5. For this to make any sense, you can't have any units. Because otherwise, these things that you're adding will be different quantities. So if x is in meters, then what can you tell me about the units of a and b? One over meters. So when you look at this integration, what can you tell me about the units of the numerator? No units. What about the units of the denominator? What about the dx? So the whole thing has to be in meters. Integral is in meters. Therefore, what's the answer? The only answer is e. You know, time to solve a problem, you know, if you think to look at units is almost zero. So, you know, I know, you know, 
a lot of exam stuff is coming up in the near future. I just want to remark a little bit about stuff like this and just the power of dimensional analysis. You know, by looking at this, the only answer that can possibly make sense is E. Okay, so in terms of you know, where we are, we've now proven Smyrna's Lemma. We're in great shape now to see how it's useful to actually prove fixed points exist. To do that, we're going to need a new coordinate system. So in some sense, one of the ways to describe what do you do in linear algebra is you learn about coordinate systems. And the whole subject, especially diagonalizing matrices, is all about changing things to be in a nice coordinate system. If I give you an ellipse that's not aligned with the coordinate axes, what do you do? Yeah, you just lean back like this, and you make new coordinate axes like this. You went through the phrase principal uh, axis theorem, something like that, or maybe axis theorem, I'm not sure what they call it, that you use this diagonalization approach to come up with a basis of eigenvectors, and then you write your transformation in terms of that basis. And you do the conjugation. We're going to do something similar. We're going to choose a new coordinate system. And the coordinate system we're going to use you know, when you're working on a triangle, is going to be related to linear combinations of the three vectors of the three points, the three vertices of the triangle. It's going to be a new set of coordinate system. And these will be called the barycentric coordinates. Now, this should be a little bit surprising at first, because I'm going to have a basis involving three points for an object in the plane. How many points do I really need in the plane? Two. So we've got to do something a little bit interesting with our coordinates and how we're going to consider combinations of coordinates. It will be very similar to what we did with the multi-objective linear programming. So what was the key insight we had when we were trying to come up with the weights between the two different items in the objective function? What did we say must be true about the weights? Sum to one. Sum to one. All non -negative. And non-negative. And so that idea is going to resurface here. All right, so this is a good place to stop. Have a good weekend. Good luck to the soccer team.